we are the start of the new hour and that means that we're continuing with the VJAC 24, the 24 hour online Java user conference, Java conference organized by Virtual Jack, which is the online only Java user group, uh, which you should totally join if you haven't uh, yet. And we will be happy to accommodate you. And this is like normal Java user group, but happening online. So we are somewhere in the middle of the conference, 24 hours, 12 hours are behind us, 11 hours are behind us. We are right at the, uh, in the middle of this epic event and I'm hoping that people are watching still and if you're just joining us on, on watching this video later on YouTube or just watching the live stream, just joining, there are a couple of things that you should know and let me, let me take you through the introductory steps. So the next session that's gonna happen currently will be 20 ways to boost your developer productivity by Sebastian Dashner uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, you can hear him. You cannot see him yet. Uh, such a massive undertaking as the VJOC 24 wouldn't be able to exist without the generous help with, from sponsors. So the sponsor for this time slot and this session is Sonotype. And the Sonotype is uh, the world's best way to organize and store and distribute software components. So you might know them as people who are holding the Maven Central. So if you're using Maven, you probably somehow were touched by the way Sonotype works and you can rely on their uh, universal and high availability intelligent uh, platforms for software distribution. So this is the sponsor for this talk. Uh, the general sponsor for the VJOC24 as a conference and the main sponsor and supporter of Virtual Jack is Zero Turnaround, the company developing tools for Java developers. And uh, you should, if you are a Java developer, you should totally check them out. They will be happy. We will be happy. Everyone will be happy. And hopefully you will like them a lot. Without further ado, let's jump into the session and start talking and meeting the participants of the session. It's not just a normal one-on-one -on -one webinar where I would be listening and Sebastian will be talking, but we have two Java use groups participating with us on this hangout. So first, please meet the Riga Java user group. Riga, you can make some noise. We can see you. Hopefully we can see you. Yay. It's lovely to see you. I understand that it's quite late. Actually, it's 10 p.m. because I'm in Tartu, which is the same time zone. Uh, Hopefully you have the better weather than Estonia because it's freezing here currently and it's quite unpleasant. Uh, but well, inside we'll manage. Another user group that we have with us today is the Manchester user group. And yay, we can see you people, the top, the front row of rocking the VJOC t-shirts. Excellent. Uh, well, all branded, excellent. Uh, hope you both of your jocks will have the great time watching the session and hopefully you will continue maybe watching a couple of sessions afterwards. So with, we have met all the participants and now let's go to the main star of this hour. Uh, it is Sebastian himself. You can see he has a very nice background uh, of Java logos. Java he, background, yeah. Hi, Oleg. Hi, hi. If you don't move very quickly, then it looks like you actually have a wall with that pattern. But if you I don't, move I don't know really, what you mean. This is my wall. <laughs> if you move quickly, we can see a hand drawing on the green screen. So uh, the technology didn't go that far yet. <laughs> so it's excellent to see you again. You've been on the vir vir uh, virtual job before, and uh, uh, you are a Java champion. You do a lot for for the Java community in general. Uh, you you've been you've been seen everywhere. You've done the Japan Jock Tour recently. You've played the most spectacular part uh, of the John One uh, community keynote. And uh, uh, yeah, so without further ado, the stage is yours. I'm sure you will introduce yourself actually properly somehow, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, yeah, talk to us about the developer productivity, please. So yeah, then hi from my side as well. And I'm 
I'm uh, very happy to be back at the virtual jug and talk about um, 20 ways how to boost your developer productivity. So a uh, less, well, technical, of course, also technical topic, but actually more like a cross-cutting um, topic that will also um, cover like mindsets, ways of thinking, and all, all kind of ways how to boost your um, productivity and how to be more effective and ultimately how to um, enjoy your job even more. So yes, um, my name is Sebastian. I'm well involved in all kind of Java things. So I'm self-employed as a Java consultant, trainer, recently also author. I help specifying the future of Java Enterprise, uh, being involved in two expert groups in Java EE8. And yeah, I'm so-called uh, Java champion. I'm an Oracle developer champion. Um, last one's Java 1, uh, Rockstar speaker, and so on and so forth. But actually, the most important uh, information is not even on that slide. Slide, it's well, I'm German, and you know what they say about Germans? Like we are efficient, right? We know how to be efficient. So, fun facts about Germany: well, there is no fun in Germany. And now, get back to work, and this is what we do, right? So, if you want to be more productive, then you better listen to a German. And uh, what I have for you in this session is 20 ways, 20 little tips, and well, 20 recommendations that helped me uh, during my career as a software developer to be more uh, productive, to be more efficient, and as I said, ultimately also to enjoy your job even more. So let's just start, right? Get, get back to work. First of all, which should be quite obvious, um, is, well, the thing, if you want to be more productive, take your mouse and throw it away. I don't care how cool it looks, and I don't care how much you know laser technology it has. Use your keyboard. Throw away your mouse, abandon your mouse, use your keyboard, and stick to the keyboard. You will be more productive. We developers tend to know that. So if you ask developers, they're like, oh, yeah, there are these keyboard shortcuts, and so on and so forth, and I would use them, and I know about all this. And then I go into project, um, projects and watch developers, and I see you know, how they click around using the mouse, using the IDE features, right-click, uh, refactor, extract method, and so on and so forth. Well, let me tell you, there's a keyboard shortcut for that. And you will be more productive if you stick to your keyboards and if you keep your hands just right there where they belong as a developer at your keyboard. Having that said, you might want to consider to get a proper keyboard, like a good one, right? And I definitely do not want to make any advertising here, but um, let me give you just the recommendations that uh, well helped me, or uh, which I found quite, quite good, quite a good fit for as a tool, right? Um, which are mechanical keyboards. In my case, this is what I would recommend. So get a proper mechanical keyboard. This brand, it's actually German, well, um, is quite well recommended. It uses, uh, I think, Jerry switches, mechanical switches uh, with Jerry blue and uh, brown switches. I would not use the blue switches if you have colleagues because they will ha hate you. They are pretty loud. The Jerry brown switches work quite well. What I can also recommend is uh, are these so-called Topper keyboards. This is a Japanese company, and it works well. It's not mechanical, but these are capacitive switches. It works a little bit like your uh, smartphone. And well, they are also pretty good. Actually, I have one um, right here, which you cannot uh, see. But well, this is what I found quite and quite fascinating. Anyway, if you look at uh, all these tools, as I said, I don't want to recommend a specific brand. You will see they are quite pricey, and you may ask the question, you know, well, Sebastian, are you really telling me I have to spend uh, three digit prices to well get one of these? Well, I would say yes, because as a developer, um, we spend a lot of time in front of the computer, right? And if you're not traveling right now and um, having to use a laptop, uh, a laptop keyboard then I would say it's quite recommended to get a good keyboard because you spend a lot of time there. And I always um, compare it to you know, a carpenter or any worker who uses tools. They would probably also not get the tools at the best, next cheapest do-it-yourself store, right? Rather than they would get proper ones. And this is also what I recommend. If you spend a lot of time there, get yourself a proper keyboard. And another small thing, since I'm German, I see a lot of German developers who use the German keyboard layout. 
which is a really bad example for keyboards layouts. There are other even worse examples like the Swiss one, because why we need special characters, like the curly brackets, brackets in general, square brackets, which are really hard to reach using this alt graphics key. What is recommended instead, and what I actually use, is the US keyboard layout, and not just that, the US international one with alt graphics and no dev keys. So what does that mean? It means, well, the US um, keyboard layout, so an English keyboard layout, where you have all the special characters at the proper place, and where you can actually type not only the German umlauts, but also French accents and how all these characters are called, where you can basically type almost every, everything you would need to, well, type uh, special characters once you write emails or something like that. But I'm very happy just writing English, actually. But anyway, you might want to consider to, to switch to a proper keyboard layer as well if you're not uh, born in the US or Canada or countries who use that already. Having that said, well, this leads to the principle that you want to embrace keyboard shortcuts in all kind of sorts. So no matter which application you're using, there is probably, no matter what you're doing, a keyboard shortcut for that, right? Especially in IDEs. If you want to refactor something, if you want to, well, of course, um, rename methods and rename classes and search for that, you know, refactor features, these features are, well, all of them reachable via keyboard shortcuts. Having that said, I would say that not all of the applications are really prime examples for embracing keyboard shortcuts, which means if you want to use them really solely with the keyboard. A good example of these applications where you can do so are, for example, IntelliJ. So they have a pretty good, I would even call it keyboard concept, where you can use, well, all kind of menus, all kind of actions with the same look and feel with the same keys. So if you're in some kind of menu, you can use Alt plus some key, which is highlighted in, I would say, very similar ways. So once you get um, used to this and once you dive into that topic, you will see uh, very similar patterns. And I would say this is a quite good example for such an application. The second only example uh, I encountered so far is Gmail, the Google Mail um, client or well website online where you can activate a um, more sophisticated keyboard uh, usage where you can do all needed actions like archive, reply, and so on and so forth solely in, in the keyboard using a Vim keyboard binding. I will talk about Vim in a second as well. But anyway, no matter what you're doing, there's probably a keyboard, um, keyboard shortcut and try to embrace these. And what it all goes down to, well, we want to type more, right? We want to spend more time typing rather than clicking around. A very good example for that is well, the command line, right? And when I say command line, I mean a proper command line, you know, like a Unix type shell, so not the thing Windows ships, rather than a proper Unix shell where you can, well, type your commands. And especially if you're on a Linux environment, you can basically do everything using the command line. And well, I can show you what, uh, what I'm doing here. So this is basically my command line. If you're using bash, this is what most people are using, I would recommend to, well, abandon this and uh, give a C shell a try. I think it's called or spelled a C shell, so C S H, C shell. Why? Well, because of two killer features. So first of all, everything that you do in Bash, you can do in C shell as well without any further thinking. You just can type uh, your commands and your syntax right away. It will work in the same way. But just because of two features, you might want to switch. The first one is you can change directories without CD. This sounds like a very small well, hack, a very small a feature, but it actually helps a lot, especially if you use the command line more and more. So what I'm doing here in my setup, I actually, well, I think I do have a file explorer installed, but I almost never use it. So what you just see on the screen, this is my environment. I use this for everything, moving files around, copying files, um, watching the files which are there, and so on and so forth. So um, if you will move around, if you go to temp, and then I have, I think, some test project, you can switch to that directory without CD. 
And this, you know, sounds like a small improvement, but once you use it, then you will really like that, that you don't have to type CD all the time. The next thing is um, you can autocomplete your directories via multiple hierarchies. What does it mean? Well, in Bash, you have to type a temp tab, right, to autocomplete it, and then test minus um, tab to autocomplete this as well. In C shell, you could just type um, slash T slash TE again, and then tap once. And if this one is unique and it's resolvable, it will resolve it all the time. And you can do this for quite a long things like ETC system, D system, Docker, something service, which I have here, and so on and so forth. And you can expand this with one hit of tap, which really helps a lot. So once um, you get used to this, you don't want to miss it anymore. And especially you notice it once you use C shell and then you switch to a server where you only have bash, then well, you try to, uh, you will start to hate bash. So this is just a small um, uh, C shell, well, recommendation, which helps you a lot. Rather than this, you want to just embrace, well, the power of the command line and also the power of Unix. So, of course, this is a quite deep and uh, advanced topic if you go into this more and more. But just using, you know, pipes with graphs, with less and so on and so forth will help you a lot and will you make you more productive. And, well, using the power of Unix and leveraging that will boost your productivity. That's, that's for sure. What also is very helpful for um, command lines, especially if you use them more and more, are shell ali aliases. So what do we Java developers do mostly when we use the command line? Well, we do something like maven clean package, right? Or grail, if you like. Or git status, right? And then you type git status all the time. Every time you want to, you see how I missed the spell it, all the time you want to access um, the status of git. Or you just use shell, shell aliases. Let me switch to the project. Test project. Or you use shell aliases like maven clean package. I typed MCP, for example, I defined this one. And you can expand it, maven clean package, or maven clean install, or whatever you need, maven fire my integration tests, git status, git push, git pull, or git pull and push with a rebase and do this for the current branch and so on and so forth, right? So actually we can fire one, so I have the project. You can um, define these for all kind of things. You will see the, for example, git aliases already come shipped with C shell or actually the um, oh my C shell extension, which I use. And you see these are a lot that you can use. Or you define your own. For example, I have a graph installed, which I actually can't show you right now how it looks. But again, this is just a long command that, well, is, uh, is packaged into an alias, which helps you a lot because you're typing the same things all over again. Um, a quite helpful um, tool in the shell is to look into this um, C shell history, the same thing exists for bash, which shows you all the commands. And you can edit this file or actually copy all the contents and sort it, for example. Then you see how often you type commands like git status. And well, there are faster ways around. And just this should be the approach. Reflect, take a step back, and look at it, what you're typing all the time, and you will, be find, you will find faster ways around it. If aliases are not enough, if you have to type, well, a lot of commands, or if you want to well, process some scripts, of course, keep, keep calm and bin bash, right? Write scripts, for example, bash scripts or C shell scripts. Actually, it doesn't matter. Most of the time, I write still bash scripts, or I still write bin bash. For example, what we're doing, let's do this build, or actually build deploy CM shell. I add this to my project, right? So I write something like this. And then you have a maven clean package. And then, you know, take the WAR file here and go to some whatever application server installation and deploy it and so on and so forth. Why? Because these are steps we have to automate all the time. So this is what, uh, what we're doing quite often. 
as Java developers, we use the command line to do all kind of well, steps needed for our normal developer uh, life, normal development steps, and then we can automate it, right? I used to do this to include um, shell scripts into my project, and then I was even too lazy for that. So now I um, wrote well, more generic, generic um, scripts and included them in my normal path. For example, I can now take Glassfish and well, clean and deploy my application there. Same for Wildfly or for Tommy and so on and so forth. So basically what it does, let me quickly show you this Wildfly. Just a very small example for this. It takes my local Wildfly installation, it searches for a WAR file residing under the target directory, and then basically um, cleans the auto deployment directory, copies it there, and starts the Wildfly, right? Just a small example for my use case, what I'm doing with enterprise development. But anyway, no matter what you're doing, there will be um, a way around, right? Same is true if you want to go one step further and not even have an installed Wildfly, if you want to uh, use Docker to, well, deploy it somewhere on your own private um, Docker image and just well, use this from a volume or whatever. You can do a Docker build as well and so on and so forth. Long story short, you want to automate things using scripts and well, you want to reflect all of the time what you are doing. So actually since, well, since I wrote these build, scri um, build scripts even over and over again for all these projects, then well, I wrote a generic one. So actually I automated like in two layers there. First of all, automate the deployment step, and then also automate writing the script. Um, same is actually true for um, generating a Maiden project. Well, there are, in fact, Maiden ar um, archetypes for that. But then over and over again, I actually have to create a lot of them because I use them in my conference talks, and I always create a small um, empty project. And then I actually just wrote a shell script, which does the same job, but faster without an internet connection. But you know. Just it's about what you're doing all the time. Try to automate it. Now, um, an also very interesting thing is this Wim way of typing, or I will even call it Wim way of thinking. So obviously, I don't want to show you an editor here. That's uh, way too boring and way too well tailored. You don't maybe don't want to use it. But let, let me tell you a story for which turned out to be the biggest productivity impact in my career. So two and a half years ago, I attended the Java Land uh, conference, which is a quite nice Java conference, by the way, in, uh, in Western Germany. And I met this guy, which you might know. Uh, his name is Dan Allen. He is involved in all kind of open source uh, Java things, but, but mostly he is the head behind the ASCII Doctor project. And well, we were chatting about um, all kind of uh, all kind of things behind the ASCII doc uh, format, the lightweight markup um, um, language, and he was showing me things in his Vim editor. And you know, we have some um, example text, and he was just showing me uh, different ways how we can do define this uh, markup standard, uh, standard, and so on and so forth. And while he was showing me that, and how was well, he was showcasing how we could change the layout. He was jumping and moving around all over the place in his editor, which totally impressed me. And then I was like, OK, I heard about this wind thing like before, this editor, nobody knows how to close. Um, now I have to look into this wind thing myself. right? And this turned out to be well, a very big improvement. So just very briefly, I don't want to show you the editor. This is actually way too much for this small session. But um, just a few things. How, it is, well, how the concepts are built here, you start in the normal mode, which means you cannot type normally here, right? Rather than you have to press a key like I first, and then you can type. And well, the reason for that is because the principle that's behind this editor is that you have to, well, you should stay on the home row all the time. Home row is F and J for your um, pointer fingers. And stay there and don't move your fingers from there. So even if you have to move the cursor around, you don't use the arrow keys rather than you use the home row. And obviously, you have to well, have multiple layers in your keyboard layout. So for example, this normal mode where you don't type normally rather than you move the cursor around with, in this case, J and K, right? And the second uh, principle behind that is that you can compose commands. 
for example, movements. If you say you can type W for jumping forward one word or B for backwards one word, and then you can, well, compose them, for example, say 2W and then jump forward for two words, or 2K for jump up two lines, right? Here on the left, you can see the relative line numbers which I use, so I can always jump in a relative way, know where to go. And then, you know, you can compose them with commands like delete two lines up or um, substitute the whole line and then write something else, right? And then repeat this command, repeat this command, jump up and so on and so forth. And well, basically the principle of staying at the home row where your fingers are supposed to be is a very big productivity to, uh, well, improvement. Because it goes back to the way of well, context switches. You want to avoid context switches, even if they're just as small as moving your fingers from the home row to the arrow keys. Because if you don't hit it immediately, you have to look into your keyboard, where are, where is my alt something insert key, which I read, need right now, and you will definitely be faster while staying where your fingers are. And actually, uh, was, uh, what I noticed is, if you use this more and more, then you even type without thinking about these things anymore. You just type right away and edit the text, which is up there, like naturally. You don't even think about, oh, I have to go up, up, up. No, you just jump there like, like magic, really. And it looks like magic if you look at people who well, um, leverage that principle and the users of Wim. So anyway, enough um, Wim advertising here. I can just recommend to look into this. And not only the editor. There is a lot of tools who embrace this Wim way of typing. For example, like I mentioned in the beginning, Gmail. There's also a plugin for your IDEs. For example, IntelliJ has Idea Vim as a plugin, which I definitely need because, well, if I want to type that way, I have to use it everywhere. So actually, even my command line uses this. I can say I can type K here for jumping up and then, well, substituting this to good, uh, goodbye and so on and so forth, which is way faster, that's for sure, because you don't have to switch to your arrow keys in this case. Now, even more about, well, automation and how, how we do things as developers. So what we do, we define all kind of things in, well, a declarative or programmatic way as code, right? We have our software as code, our source code, right? We have configuration as code, which means we don't have to configure stuff manually. We don't have to log in or we should not log in into a server and then change some configuration. No, rather than we have configuration as code, change some server configuration in our project, and then have some standard process to execute and apply this for us. Same is true for infrastructure as code, right? Like Docker files or Kubernetes YAML files. If we want to specify how we do our server installations, for example, how our application servers are installed and defined, including Java, the specific versions, the server configuration down to the operating system, we do so as infrastructure as code, right? For example, Docker files or Kubernetes YAML files. Kubernetes takes us one step further. We have Kubernetes resources that, for example, with the services and deployments, can specify how we deploy one or, uh, or several services and connect them using the network, right? And this goes even further. I would say let's do everything as code. Everything you could possibly, well, specify and everything that at first included time and effort to do so can be specified as code. For example, your laptop installation. It definitely requires time and effort to set up your laptop with all this configuration you, you know, did with a lot of time and effort involved. So you have your perfect environment with all the toolings um, and so on and so forth. Well, you can automate this. You can specify that as code in very simple ways. For example, like a shell script. If you're using Linux, this is quite easy, especially if you use the command line. So what I do if I have, well, some server installation the first time or some laptop installation, I do it once. Then I take, as I told you, this um, shell history file and use this more or less as a script. Paste everything into a script, done. And then you can execute it with maybe a few adjustments. Or anyway, at least, well, document it, right? so that you know what you did and you have all this time and effort involved only once. 
but ideally have everything as code, not just in your project, not just in your enterprise or any software project, but also on your local installation. This, again, embraces automation, right? We want to automate everything. Why? Well, I would say automation is the way how we use computers in a correct way. Computers are very good at doing very stupid things, but very reliably and fast. Execute things reliably and fast. Humans are very bad at this. If you put a human into a labor worker on a field, they will sooner or later start a rebellion. If you put humans to, um, in, to do a server installation, to do um, system administrator jobs, they will sooner or later do errors because this is what we humans do, right? If we have well, manually boring tasks that we have to execute, we are bad at this. Humans are much better at doing creative work, at thinking, like deep work, right? Doing creative um, tasks, which computers are bad. So basically, use the computer right, try to automate everything that you can, and, well, use your brain to do the creative, the deep, and the complex thinking where computers are bad. And, well, this goes back to all kind of things, for example, even shell scripts, right? Or, of course, tests. You want to test in an automated way. Why? Because you're shipping software, and you want to ship software with a high quality. So if you have, you know, an application with 100 use cases and more, and this is not even big, you ideally testing all the 100 use cases each and every time you ship that software. So, you know, as I, uh, as I just told you, humans are bad at um, executing manual, error-prone, boring tasks. You should use your tests in an automated way. This not only includes that your tests run automated, um, in an automated way, but also verify that. So you don't have to run your tests and then look, well, was this correct? No, the test should itself already verify whether this was correct. Then again, you can use creative ways of thinking how to, well, achieve this. For example, it might not be that easy, like in enterprise um, development, if you have some front end, some GUI involved, you have to see whether this is correct. Yes, maybe the first time for exploratory testing, and then the second, the third time, you can tell the computer how to verify it. For example, comparing screenshots and all kind of things. You can be creative, but you want to run all these things in an automated way. Do it first manually to verify that it's correct and then automate. And this is true for all kind of tasks. Of course, same thing applies for continuous delivery, right? We want to well, ship, build, ship, and run our software in a fast and reliable way. Therefore, we want to use continuous delivery the same way that I showed you before um, with the local environment, right? I had the local Maven clean package and then whatever, do um, application server installation, do maybe a Docker build, Docker run. You can automate this on your server environment, obviously, and try to embrace these things. Not just say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We know about this and we're trying to make some resources. No, do it now. Your future, your self will thank you because then, Again, you can focus on what humans are better, doing creative um, work, doing deep thinking, right, and not just executing stuff. Now a few coding things, a few more coding stuff. IDE live templates, or at least this is how it is called in IntelliJ. Live templates, what are these? Well, again, embracing automation, at least a little bit. If we have some class, some Java class, um, oh, SDK is not defined, we probably need that. We are coding some things all over again, and while well, I'm involved in enterprise Java, so I, for example, have to type at inject all the time using the correct import and then inject something, right? Boring, we do this all the time without even thinking about it. Well, but typing at inject, you don't know how many times I misspelled it and how many times, well, at inject there's only one import, but if you want to use the correct import and, you know, this is annoying. You can also just type templates like I defined IJT and then hit tab and it will already auto import, well, the correct thing that you want. Hello, for example. Same is true for how many times did I write, well, entity manager, right? At persistent context, entity manager, entity manager. 
long thing to write. Even longer is managed executor service. Or what else could you have? In Java EE, have, well, an initializer method with add post construct, or same is true for pre-destroy, and so on and so forth. So all the things you have to type all the time, even these small things, can be automated. There will be a faster way. So again, try to take a step back. Try to look and see what you're doing all the time. You can actually even record yourself while you're coding. You will well, get a lot, a lot of interesting insights there. And then try to find a faster way around, for example, live templates. And well, this goes back to well, helping you where you can be more productive. For example, this is my POM file. And how many times did I use, I think it's called search.maven.org, to see what's the latest version of whatever JUnit plus S, um, SRJ and so on and so forth. There's a live template, or actually, I defined this one, where I can say, please give me JUnit, Mojito, and SRJ in the test scope because I need it. And you can specify that in your correct version, and so on and so forth. If you want to update the version, you only do it once, right? And you will save yourself some time. So this is basically the idea behind that. This goes back to use shortcuts. Really, shortcuts are your friends. Try to find them everywhere you can. No matter what you're doing, try to reflect, uh, reflect take a step back, and ask yourself, is there a way to do this faster, to do this easier, or to automate this in any way? And I'm pretty sure there might be a way, like these live templates, which you just showed. So actually, I can show you how you can configure them. This is, well, IntelliJ specific, but anyway, there is a section called live templates, and you can even define your own. So the one I showed you are, well, not shipped, but I just defined them for uh, things I need all the time. But it doesn't even matter, no matter which technology you're using, you will have your own, own ones, but you know there will be some, and use shortcuts in all kinds of sorts. Now, a more general topic of distractions and, and how to focus. And well, actually, there are a lot of books um, with this topic, so a lot of interesting things. I read a lot of, well, interesting books and topics um, about this. It's basically the problem with if you automate more and more, and if you use the computer in a correct way, so you can get rid of all these boring tasks that we don't want to do anyway, right? We want to develop. We want to develop features. We do not want to execute tests in, an, in a manual way. We do not want to click here to uh, install or deploy our application. No, we want to write code, and then the rest is just done in an automated way. This goes with the problem that actually more and more of your thinking is, well, deep work, uh, where you have to concentrate, where you have to focus, where you have to get into the flow. And this is quite important, a quite important topic, because all the small things that distract you all the smartphones, all the emails, all the annoying coworkers that bother you with stuff are distractions to your focus, to your flow. You will be less productive the more distractions you have. This is actually the reason why I'm a very big fan of Linux, because this is what you see. This is not prepared actually for the session. Well, I increased the font size, but this is my normal working environment. So there is nothing missing here. This is actually it. If I don't have this in a full screen, you will see a very small thin line here showing me the current date and whether I have enough laptop, laptop battery, and that's it. This is what I like about that. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to see this annoying icon blinking somewhere. I don't want to see this annoying um, email notification. I just shut it all off. And Linux, well, here in this case, helps me a lot with that. I don't want to have Windows updates and so on and so forth. Same is true for smartphones which are um, turned to silent for me mostly all of the time. These are just distractions. If you're in a loud environment, you can get yourself a pair of these of earplugs. I actually also got some, some custom tailored ones because they um, cut away even more noise, and you can focus quite well. This goes away and um, goes along with working environments. I don't know who of you knows where that is. That was recorded on Jay Crete which is, I would say, the, the best, the nicest uh, Java unconference on the island of Crete, which is always quite funny. If I tell somebody uh, of uh, J. Crete, they tell you, oh, well, you're just doing vacation there, right? But actually, you won't believe how productive that is, working there, or just we mostly do you know, half, um, half a day of content, of 
unconference uh, things, philosophizing about IT or hacking, and half a day of you know enjoying yourself, going to the beach or whatever. But just this half uh, half of the day, just these four hours or something, are so productive you won't believe it, because you are in a super relaxed atmosphere. Nothing is bothering you. No, no um, noisy traffic. No city. It's just super relaxed. You have the ocean right beside you, and you can focus really well. You can go get into the flow, and you can just well be very productive. And now a few more uh, things with well, they help you a lot in the productivity. Uh, buzzword like inbox zero. So well. I don't want to talk too, uh, too much about this, and I also think this is a really buzzword and hype topic. Well, what is this about, Inbox Zero? So for me, it's actually just about defining processes and uh, touching things only once. Why? For example, if I, want, uh, if I go to my inbox and I have hundreds of emails, well, they distract me. Why? Because if I see an email 10 times before I actually deal with it, then it will distract me 10 times, because I will kind of think, um, think about it, even if I don't want to, like how I should respond, how I have to do this and that. And actually, I do want to deal with it once. So I defined a process for myself, a simple one, doesn't even matter. But you know, like if the email takes less than two minutes with responding or with doing something, I do it right away. If no action is required, I just well delete it or archive it right away. Or if action is required, which takes longer, I move it to a specific folder and I add an item on my to-do list to do it later. Why? Because if I then refresh the next time, I will see new emails, which is fine. But then I won't see the old ones, which would distract me. The same is true for to-do lists. Keep a to-do list. No, really, I mean it. Well, this sounds obvious, but well, a few things about to-do lists. First of all, it's very helpful at the beginning of the day or at the end of the previous day to think about all the things you have to do in your project as developer or even personally. Right? You just write them down, and this already helps a lot. You can sort them by priority, and you have on paper what you want to do. There is a lot of a variety of tools around that for to-do lists. right? But just a few recommendations from my side, because this could be a quite simple topic if you just, for example, do text files. Why? What I dislike about most um, to-do list apps is, well, if you have one single to-do list, this grows and grows and grows. Well, that's natural. But if I see my 50 or more tasks, which are still not done yet, I immediately get distracted and obviously get overwhelmed by the variety of what's in there. So I look into the to-do list, and I don't even want to start, because this is way too much. right? Rather than what you want to do, you can start each and every day with a blank space, or at the end of the day, and write what you want to do tomorrow or today. And then, very important, you don't delete what you have done, rather than you just move it at the bottom of the list and, or into a, a, a second section. So you can see what you have done, if you want to reflect it. For example, you do a new to-do list for every day. And if your project manager asks you, what have you done in that week, you just do a, a cat or a grab on that folder where all these text files are and say, oh, this is what I'm done here. Easy, finished, right? And also, you do, don't want to be distracted, which goes along with the concept of I call blinders. Same that you saw before here in this environment, distractions. There are no distractions here. Like blinders, I only see what I want to see. Same is true for to-dos. Why? I often, I don't know if you know uh, this yourself, when I'm coding or when I'm thinking about a problem, I have, why, I don't know, some thoughts about a random topic. Oh, I still have to do this. I still have to uh, reply on that. And I have this thought or idea, which I don't want to lose because I have to do it. But I saw if I now open a to-do list app, and type that in what I have to do, well, this distracts me. Because then I see all the 50 things which are still not done yet, and I have to add it, which is bad. Then your overall focus is gone. So instead, what I want to do, I have this thought for any reason whatsoever. I type something like a small shell script, which basically adds stuff to a text file at the end. And I say, I'm thinking about some important task. And then I add it. Done. 
That's it. I know it will be somewhere and I don't have to open my task list, which I well it will show me all the things which I haven't done yet. Rather than I can just type it in like a box to drop, drop box, hit enter, and now it's gone. And now I can continue what I'm actually doing. And this is again, well, the concept of I would call blinders and how you could one way how you could um, use to-do lists. But again, try to not be distracted by anything. What I told you several times, you should once in a while take a step back and reflect. Reflect what you're doing all the time, what your daily job looks like, and where there are things, either big or small, that could be done better, that could be automated, where there are shortcuts, or that could be even eradicated with an easier way. There are several ways how to do this. For example, look at histories, look at tool usage, what features and what things you're doing all the time. Maybe even record yourself while coding and see all the features that, uh, that you use. Ask your coworkers for their favorite IDE shortcuts and features and so on and so forth. Maybe even start like a campaign in your own project where who has the best automation hacks wins and the best shell scripts and so on and so forth. And well, you can get a lot of ideas. Actually, most of these ideas I, I got by watching other coworkers, and you can always be inspired. And well, this is just a few things that help myself. You will definitely find different, other, more things. Once you do this, take a step back of what you're doing all the time, reflect and try to think, well, is there a better way to do so? Then another very interesting thing where we developers are not really good at is documentation. And why, why I like documentation? Because it helps you, it helps your future self. Because I want to do things only once, right? If I want to do things again, well, I, don't want, I want to avoid that, right? I don't want to do things several times. I don't want to have déjà vu effects. So if I document how I do things, I know how I do things right now, tomorrow I will forget anything, right? And there's the saying that uh, source code, which is half a year old, looks like source code from a different person. Because you will definitely forget what you have done half a year ago. Actually, I would say for me, this is true even for two weeks. I have no clue what I've done there. And it looks like somebody wrote this code, but definitely not myself. So you want to document. Now document what you're doing. Obviously, that's part of the code, but why are you doing that? Why did we choose that specific version of this and that? Why did we implement this in this way? What did I do to install the server? What, what is needed? What should I remind myself? And so on and so forth. All the things which you say, oh, I have this in my mind. No, you don't. And if you do have it in your mind, then your coworkers don't. So try to document everything you can. Having that said, it doesn't have to be textual documentation. You can document in all kinds of ways. For example, a shell script. How do I install that server? Well, if you have a nice installation shell script, that's part of the documentation. That's how you install it. You don't have to document it twice. No, look at the script. That's also part of the documentation. But try to leverage it. And of course, read documentation. Not just these small documentations in, well, scripts, code, and all kinds of things from your coworkers. No, also the official documentation. It helps you a lot in all kinds of tools, in all kinds of frameworks and technologies if you read the documentation. Trust me, there were so many times in my career when I said, okay, I will try this, I will stack overflow that, and then uh, again, it didn't work, and finally after three hours, okay, I resign. I look into the documentation and then 15 minutes or less done. I read it once, I understood the concept, and oh my God, of course it cannot work because of this, and there you go. So once in a while, I tried to read the documentation. I saw um, actually that open source documentation gets better and better. For example, prime examples, which I really like, uh, the Kubernetes documentation and the OpenShift documentation. And there might be many, many more, which I would say are really good examples for open source, where people are really eager to document things. Another good examples are um, JSRs, for example, the CDI specifications, really well written where you can just look at that once and then you understood the concepts and how you do things. This also goes along with the principle, I would say, of don't make me think, or at least don't make me think twice. Because as I said before, everything that involves time and effort, well, 
is fine if it does so, but it should only involve time and effort once, right? And then again, you can use automation, you can use shell scripts, you can use tools that help yourself, you know, right? As if you were the customer, try to make the tools as convenient as possible. If you write a shell script and you don't know how to use it again, how these parameters work, then do a usage page. Like if you um, just execute it right away, that tells you, oh, please use it in this way. Principle of don't make me think. Just try to be nice to yourself, to your future self, and do things well, easier, right? And then you will be also more productive. And now a very last thing and a very important thing. I talked a lot about, well, saving time, about how to do this and that, how to be more productive, how to be more efficient, which definitely will save you time, which you can use to, as I said, do deep work, do creative ways of thinking, but actually you should also use the time that you saved because if you do automation specifically, you will save a lot of time to relax. Productivity is definitely not about getting more and more and more done because at the end of the day, you will be just blown away. You will be totally exhausted because all these error prone tasks are now gone and you could do something different. Well, you could also just relax once in a while. And this is also very important to be productive because otherwise you will be, well, exhausted and dead at some point and not be able to um, execute any further tasks. Having that said, there, even as a developer or especially as a developer, there is no substitute for doing sports, for healthy diets and for enough sleep. So thank you very much. Yay. Bonus points for healthy diet and doing sports. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, excellent session. A uh, ton of great advice. Uh, uh, let's see if we have any questions. So as usual, the local jocks present here take the precedence. Uh, we'll start with Manchester Jock. If you have any questions to Sebastian, please uh, reach out. Uh, excellent. I think we have a question. Yeah, yeah, you can okay. just come yourself you can ask. Yes. Hi, Sebastian, can you hear me? Hey there. Um, I'm, I'm big on the productivity. I really, I really enjoyed your, your talk. Um, I've got a, so you mentioned about reflecting. Um, I've got a, I don't know if you've ever used a journal before, but I've found so running multiple projects is very distracting and knowing your priorities is quite important. So, I tend to use the best self journal, which I found to be one of the best journals ever because it, it, it mentions uh, sort of uh, concentrate on three things every day and not more than three things because everything else, as you say, is, is like a distraction. So, what, is your, what, what are your thoughts about um, journaling and that sort of thing? Um, Oleg, did you understand that? I didn't get the last part because there was a, a huge echo in um, your side. I, I think I heard that one. That was um, <clears throat> okay. So, so, so the crux of it, I think, was I didn't hear the last bit, but the crux of it was if you have multiple multiple projects, all with varying um, priorities, uh, which uh, how do how do you you know the others obviously seem like distractions. Was that was that about right? Yeah, it was also around. Um, do you do you journal and what do you recommend as journaling? What do you use? Okay, so do you journal and what what would you recommend for that? Um, for, 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 oh, for, for journaling in, uh, related to projects or in general? So, so in general, um, the best self journal recommends um, you to reflect so you, you, you almost are grateful. So that if, when you start in the morning, you write about the things you're grateful for. Before you go to bed, you write about your day and, and positive things. Yeah, I can, I can definitely recommend that to, to do journaling or to keep a diary or whatever you call this. So this is what I'm doing, in, uh, in fact. And what I'm using actually is just well, a plain text file with, with the Vim editor. So, well, basically that, that's my uh, way of, uh, well, uh, of, of, of keeping, keeping track of that. I would say it, it also depends on, really depends on what you're trying to do. So this would be more like a personal like diary or journaling to say, okay, what did I achieve? So actually, as a matter of fact, um, I, I can briefly show uh, uh, what, what I'm doing in, you know, like I have some some text here with a, uh, with a small explanation what I did do today. Well, I woke up at this time and then I did uh, this and that. And then I always include a plus minus list. So basically what went well, 
for example, I finished a project. And then what did not went well, I was not motivated in the evening, in the afternoon or something like that. And then I also include things that I learned today. For example, how to use Kubernetes uh, correctly, something like this. And of course, it depends, um, as I said, what, what you're doing. So for example, if you use this for a project or for several projects, you can have specific things which well, are custom tailored to your project, to what, to what you're doing, right? And you could also use uh, some kind of tooling. So I'm pretty sure there are tons of toolings around. Um, as I said, I personally prefer an easy way with um, with plain text files. And once, for example, you are quite familiar with Vim or another product uh, productive editor, you will be equally fast, I would say. Or of course, you can use all kind of toolings. But I just, for that reason, cannot really recommend something since I uh, personally use um, text files. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. One thing, if I could add one thing, actually, uh, yeah. about um, uh, when you have multiple multiple projects in or lots on at the same time, uh, one thing I found really, really useful is this book, um, Getting Things Done by David mm -hmm. Allen. Um, and, and he's got he's got a really really great way of, of being able to show like like line up your projects, line up what your to dos are on the projects because distractions can come from your actual work as just as well as other things, right? So if you're if you're working on like ten things, what is the next thing you do, and and how do you stop yourself from constantly context switching or turning into the journal yourself? And getting things done is a really great, but it, it helped me from. Actually, I've started. I started on that for about a year ago, and it really helped me. So I'd recommend that as well. Yeah, I can. I can totally second that. Yeah, and basically, as a recommendation, you just try to avoid context switches as much as you can. Hmm. And I'd say the tools, whatever works for you, is, is good for tools in terms of how you implement that. But it's more of a process thing than a, than a tools thing. That that book. Yes, totally agree. Fully agree. Excellent. Uh, we have time perhaps for one quick question as well. Riga, if you have any questions. Riga. Riga! Yay. Come on, I know you have questions. Yes, can you hear us? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Come on, I know we have questions. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us? Yes, All right. So, uh, I have sorry, sorry, sorry. There is a terrible echo. I muted you. So your question will go through Slack. Like there is really like terrible echo multiple times back and forth. Let's try again. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, maybe try to move the microphone away from the speakers. I'm okay. Trying. Yeah, yeah this maybe is better. Trying. Yeah, this is better. Sorry, this one works. Uh, just. Uh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay, we together. I think we muted them. Sorry about this uh, technical difficulty. Riga, uh, Java user group, don't get discouraged. Uh, please ask your questions in the Slack. And I'm just the reason as to why you should use speakers, though, right, uh, Sebastian? Uh, headphones. The headphones. And the <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Was it my speakers that did the. Oh, no. no that yeah, means. that's totally your fault. Yeah. You have the most complicated setup here. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So it's, it's, no, it's not your fault. Uh, it's uh, it's an artifact of having multiple computers join uh, in the same room, probably, or just having a separate microphone speakers. It's an echo thing, video conferencing. Anyway, uh, we're out of time. So uh, all the questions, are you in the Slack group? You should be in the Slack group. If you're not in the Slack group, please, Sebastian, join the Slack group, and then uh, we will have a short discussion with you, and you can ask for any additional questions that people have. Thank you once again for the session. Wonderful yeah. advice. Uh, if anyone is watching us now and you have more questions to Sebastian, just find him on Twitter and figure out what he thinks about uh, whatever questions you have. So thank you, the Manchester Jug. Thank you, Riga Jug. It, it's been wonderful to host you uh, for the session. And we should stop and we should go into the short pause before the next one. And I think Simon is managing the pause now. 
Yeah, we might uh, we might just carry on straight through. I think because uh, we're pretty much we're pretty much at time now. Um, yeah, we see we see people joining as well. So. So let me grab this up. So yeah, massive thank you to everyone. And for user groups, if you wanted to stay on, you're more than welcome to stay on. Um, and I'll uh, I'll start in just a second. <laughs>